Mr. Jarris, how you doing? Jimmy, how you doing, bud? Look at you guys, Jimmy getting anxious. Jarris, two more days. Hello, Josh. So we're just waiting for a few more people to uh, kick on and then we'll get going. Hey, Tony, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. So, um, okay, so tonight we're going to cover Attracted Sense. I just got in some of the hot scents. Ty, good evening. Um, also going to introduce you guys to a new call that just hit the market. It's called Game Changer. And we are going to go through my daily food bag. So, and of course, just like always, if you guys have any questions, shoot your questions in. Dustin, two more days to see these beauties. First time you're here, super excited. Mad Viking, welcome. So, um, yeah, you guys, I mean, two days. We are still a week away. So we don't open until the 30th. So, but definitely ready. Um, in fact, I was talking to somebody the other day. They were asking uh, if I was excited to be chasing screaming bulls. And I told them I was really, really looking forward to some good solid naps on the mountainside. And they were kind of surprised that uh, I chose that I was more excited for naps than I was for chasing bulls. I mean, don't get me wrong. I am extremely excited to be chasing bulls. But with, um, you know, all of the videos and the stuff with Carbon TV and working on new sponsors and all the lessons, I'm tired. I, I am tired. Jarrah's weather forecast is looking good for the weekend too. Yeah, actually, I looked at the weather. Our our opening weekend in Idaho is going to be highs in the upper 60s with lows in the low 40s. So it is going to be an absolutely perfect opening weekend. And the cool thing is, is we have rain coming in either Saturday or Sunday or Monday to uh, knock some of the fires down. Uh, Tex Grant, hello. Larry, hello from West Virginia. Welcome, welcome. So, all right, <clears throat> let's get rolling, guys. So, okay, first off, we are going to cover what's in my daily food bag. So, what I do is I bring in a lot of different things and I break them up into piles and I bring in enough food so that I can make these gallon zipper lock bags right here and I have one bag for every day that I'm out in the field for the whole entire month. So, so to get my pack ready, um, all I have to do is grab one of these and throw it in my pack. Now, everybody's going to be a little bit different because, you know, how many calories you need and all that is, um, Billy Jones, I know what you mean, too many irons in the fire. Yes, and some of them are glowing red hot, but but you guys need to figure out how many calories you need. So this is just what I carry. So, all right, first off, green belly meals, meals to go. Um, this one right here is the cranberry almond. They also have a banana chocolate. Um, they, they've got a few different flavors, but cool thing, JD from New Mexico, welcome. Here's the cool thing about these green belly meals. It, it basically has two bars in it. This package right here alone is 650 calories. So, okay. So what we're talking about right now with this pack, this is just what I have in my pack during my day. Okay. So breakfast, when I get up, I either have some Heather's Choice oatmeal or maybe a Mountain House biscuits and gravy. Um, you know, something along that. It's usually biscuits and gravy from Mountain House or it's Heather's Choice or oatmeal or you know, there's, there's some different options out there, but that's my breakfast. Jason, hello from Colorado. How many meals in the pack, breakfast and lunch? I just take lunch in my pack because of the number of calories that I have in here. Okay. Then when I get back to camp, then I have a mountain house or 
something else like that. So, okay. So first thing, green belly meals, 650 calories right there in that thing. It's awesome. Also, be good bars is something else that I have in here. So it's, it's just something quick. It has a little bit of chocolate in there. Heather's Choice Packaroons. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever tried these packaroons. These are extremely addictive. This is the lemon lavender. There's two discs in there. They're about that big around and about that thick. They're just, these are awesome because, you know, you could actually throw this little package in the side pouch. If you've got BDU pants that have pockets on the side, throw one of these. You can just bring it out and munch on it while you're, you're walking. All right, jerky. So protein in there as well. Trail mix, so I can get some salts and also some more chocolate and more sugars. Isogenics Amped Fuel. Um, it's just a little fuel kick. Um, I do also have little ISO shots that I will throw in there also along with these. And then, of course, somebody gave me a bad time about this, but I don't care what you say, Pringles cups. Got to have Pringles. So all in all right there, I'm pretty dang close to eight, 850 calories just for during the day. Now, I don't, you know, when I break, I don't sit down and eat all of this at once. I kind of graze, you know, throughout the day on them. But... Like I said, neat thing is you have this gallon Ziploc bag that all of your trash and everything just goes right back into. But then also the cool thing is, is if you guys are out there, and I know we never see this because everybody picks up garbage after themselves. Nobody needs or nobody leaves trash out there, right? Wait a minute. That's a perfect world. Okay. People are pigs. So always finding trash, always finding bottles. You know what? You've got something there that you can pick up some trash and throw it in. Now, the other thing is in my hydration bladder. This is ballistic and magma from Ready Nutrients. The ballistic is a pre-workout that it's it's not caffeine. It doesn't give you a huge rush. It's, it's just sustained pre-workout energy. And then the magma or the magma is BCAA, glutamines and electrolytes. So basically getting a little bit of energy from the ballistic and getting some recovery and electrolytes in the magma. So that's basically what I carry in my pack each day. Now, also in my pack, I, I, I have a three liter bladder. Um, I, I've gone back and forth between water bladders and water bottles. The thing that I noticed is when I have a bladder with the tube right there, I tend to drink more water and stay more hydrated. Now, the place I hunt, there's quite a few creeks and springs and seeps. So I have the MSR trail shot with me that I can, uh, you know, especially when we break for a day because the elk have gone to bed and we're going to break. I just pull out that trail shot and top off my bladder. So I'm never out of water. So Neat thing is when I get back to camp at the end of the day after hunting all day, I pull that empty bag with the garbage out, throw it in the garbage can, grab a new pack or, or a new, new bag, throw it in my pack. My pack's ready for the day. I have water. I have food. I don't have to do any of that. So then basically just boil my water, cook my dinner, which like I said, a lot of times it's, it's mountain house. I am actually going to be field testing a couple of other Ellen. My man, Naps and Pringles. Absolutely. And in my pack, I actually carry an XL, para, an extra large size parachute hammock so that when I break for that, um, yeah, I'm in that hammock. Sam, thanks again for the lesson. Feeling confident. Sam, I'm excited for you. Um, you know, you've, you've, you've definitely got the grasp of the calling. You're, uh, you're going to do well. I'm excited to hear the stories. Joshua, best quote I heard all day. People are pigs. Well, they are. I, I mean, they, people don't, ex, don't, ex, there is no appreciation for our public lands anymore. 
I don't know how many times that you go up to campsites and there's just piles of trash in the burn ring or this or that. But anyways, don't don't get me started on that. So uh, back on the food. So like I said, nighttime dinner, it's Mountain House. I am field testing a couple of others this year. Uh, peak oatmeals. Um, those are a couple of others that I'm testing. Normally, guys, I make my own meals. And I know, you know, we've talked about that I was going to do a video to show you guys how you can make your own meals. Unfortunately, time just got away from me before season. So I promise this winter I will do a video and give you guys the places where you can pick up some of the dehydrated stuff and make your own meals. So the cool thing if you make your own meals is you control the serving sizes you control the seasonings, you control the amount of sodium in them. And I mean, you can think of any recipe that you can make at home and you can get the components from dehydrated suppliers. And I'll, I'll give those to you guys on the video and you can just make your own dehydrated meals. I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome if you want to make stroganoff, if you want to make chili mac, I, I mean, just spaghetti. I mean, anything that you guys can think of. So Okay, moving on. I just got these in today. This is from Hot, Hot on the Trail Sense. So they do look like deodorant sticks. If you get confused one morning and use this for deodorant, I can guarantee you will only do it one time. But that day you are going to hike a ton because you are going to be smelling elk all day long. Check out Outdoor Pantry freeze-dried meals. They are great. Yeah, Eric, I've, I've heard about Outdoor Pantry too. I've tried a couple of their things. So, um, but definitely we'll, we'll look at them more. So, okay, within the sense, this is the Elk Bull Blend. What the Bull Blend does is basically when a bull is raking, he is releasing scent glands. He has scent glands that he's putting on that rub. This bull blend kind of does that same thing. So imagine if, if you're working in an area and you come across a rub line, you pull this out of your pack and you just start rubbing this, you know, take the cap off, rub it right on the trees. And you do this on every one that he's already rubbing on. T, how you doing, bud? Um, he's going to come in and all of a sudden he's going to smell another bull raking on his rub line. He's not going to be too happy. Other blend or other blends that they have. Cow Elk Estrus. And then finally, Elk Serenity. Okay, what the Elk Serenity is, is that is basically a um, bedding area. So you have a bull blend, you have a bedding area, you have a cow and estrus. I've been using this for years with great success. There's a couple of things that I really, really like about it. One it's not liquid at all, which a lot of states are starting to make liquid cow urines illegal because that's how CWD is transferring, chronic wasting disease is transferring from these elk farms and getting out into public herds. Does Sportsman's Warehouse carry that scent stick? No, but you guys can go directly, just type in hot on the trail and that'll take you to their website and you can just order order directly from there. Mark's pretty quick. He shipped these out Sunday or Monday and I just got them today. So really, really quick, but definitely check out Mark. He does have others. He's got cover scents like earth, sage, cedar, pine. Um, sometimes I will take that, take the cap off this and just throw it in my scent scent lock box that I have all of my camo in. Um, I don't use the cover scents a bunch, but I do use the attractant scents. Now, these are made, like I said, they're a solid. You basically, and you guys, I'm going to do uh, in the field tutorials here, you know, this this year while out hunting. Um, but the cow estrus blend, like if I'm, if I'm doing a breeding sequence, I'll actually pop the cap off. And I'll just rub this on the bark. And the cool thing is, it's not overpowering like a liquid is at first and then fades. And the cool thing is, is I've come back in an area a couple of days later and I've still seen some of this on the bark with still a little bit of a smell. So it definitely lasts. So now, 
since you guys are so awesome and Mark was generous enough to send us extras, here is what I'm going to do. Colorado Solo Hunter, how you doing? Okay, for all of you guys on here or listening to this, you have until Friday. I have the video, the 2018 Grunt Tube Challenge that's on the YouTube channel. Everybody that watches the video and then votes for the tube that they think sounds the best is going to go into a drawing. <coughs> so you have until Friday. I'm going to pull <laughs> Matthew comment on the video on YouTube. So everybody that comments and votes, I'm going to put everybody into a hat. And then I'm going to draw one winner. And one winner is going to win a three-pack of this. Actually, you're going to win a four-pack. You're going to win an elk bull, an elk cow estrus, an elk scent, and the earth blend. And heck, I'm being generous. I'm going to throw in a wind checker with it that Mark sent over. And a wristband. So, Jairus, vote on YouTube or Facebook, too. Um, I'm only going to pull off of the YouTube, Jarris. And the number one voted for Bugle. Who thinks? Hello. <laughs> Dimitri, I am going to film the results video on Saturday when I'm up pulling trail cameras. That's why I say you guys have until Friday. Um, so, but yeah, I'm going to pull results and then uh, go from that. Best source for elk tips out there. Thanks, Brother Scott. I appreciate that. So, Okay, moving onward and upward. Remember, guys, any questions you have, throw them in. A new call was sent to me last week. If you vote three times, does that count as three entries? Jimmy, nice try. One entry per person. So, okay, owner of Game Changer got a hold of me. Actually, a buddy of mine, Matt Lux, got a hold of me first. Um, asked what I thought of this call, ended up getting a hold of the owner. This is a brand new call that's produced out of Oregon. It is four inches long. Cool thing about this is there's two different baffles in here that have latex in it. Now, as a new caller, a lot of times you struggle building back pressure. What's the advantage of back pressure? Well, back pressure allows you to hold those notes, transition a little easier, um, so the game changer does that, but it, the other thing too, is normally on a, um, Peter Hess from four corners, Colorado. Hello, hello. Welcome. Um, normally a diaphragm read has a little bit of unnatural vibration. Look at that. We talk about Matt Lux introducing me to the game changer and he pops in. That's great timing, Matt. Appreciate it. So, okay. Diaphragm read typically has a little bit of unnatural vibration. Now the game changer, if you call through the small end, <coughs> just really, really cleans those tones up. Now the other thing that's kind of cool about this, I called through the small end on that. If you turn it around and you call through the big end, It muffles it. So if you're in a setup and you want to sound like you're another 100 yards away, absolutely do that. But the other cool thing about this little tiny deal <laughs> you can bugle through it. So if you are Eric, so it's like a micro bugle tube. Exactly, at four inches long. How many of you guys also coyote hunt? You have a good versatile call. Now, Friday, um, I took this out last weekend and I actually recorded a full-blown review video on it. You can hear it out in the forest. 
I'm amazed on how good this thing sounds out there. It sounds so natural. So um, I will also have a link. So G4 Archery is the only place that's that's selling them right now. So if you guys want one, I know your hunt's coming up. Go buy G4 Archery there in Hillsboro, Oregon and buy one. Or you can just type in g4archery.com. Go to their website. They have multiple different colors. Uh, pick one up. But like I said, Friday night's video is going to be the full review on that. So, okay. We had some other things kind of stroll through. Uh, where was it? Matt, it's going well. T-Wald hex suit. Um, yes, I have worn the hex suit. I do like it. Um, I do think it works. So there's there's a few things because it makes it, it it makes sense for those of you that don't know what the hex suit is it's it's a human electronic concealment system what it does it 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 blocks your electrodes it blocks that magnetic field that our body our body omits okay do animals really clue into magnetic field absolutely how do you think they know where they're going on their migration routes so they they definitely to you know tune into that the thing with the hex suits though because there's so much there's actually more carbon in a hex suit than there is most carbon suits it's woven into the thread in it that is then stitched into a faraday cage principle and if if you really want to understand a faraday cage throw, pop something in your microwave close the door start watching in that grid system that's on the front of the microwave that blocks the magnetic waves that is the Faraday cage principle. Because there's that much carbon in the hex suit, it is warm. It is a warm suit. But the other, the, the other critical thing is, if you hunt with three other people, you're wearing the hex suit, the other three are not, it really doesn't do much good. So it's kind of an all in or all done. So, uh, but yes, the hex suit, I have worn it. I do definitely think it works. Eric, I just bought the large Phelps just before one of the small ones came out, but this thing seems legit. I don't need to produce big monster bull sounds, just enough to locate, uh, just enough to locate them and sneak in. I think this thing might be the ticket. Yes, and actually on the review video, I talk about a couple of other things that you guys can certainly do with that thing. But like I said, for, you know, for a four inch call, Game changer is is pretty dang impressive. I'm definitely going to be using it for um, definitely my cow vocalizations um, this year. So, okay, uh, that's an awesome little tool. What do you think of Ozonics? Honestly, I have never used Ozonics, so I can't really. Um, say one way or another on it. I, I, I do have a lot of friends that do use Ozonics. They swear by it. Um, but really the only time that I'm really tree stand hunting is in the springtime over a bear bait. Um, rest of the time, I'm just, I'm not much of a tree stand or ground blind guy. I mean, even turkey hunting, I'm, I'm running and gunning. So, so unfortunately I, I really can't speak on the uh, effectiveness or benefits, benefits of Ozonics. I have thought about um, getting one and trying it uh, during the spring, but uh, I just haven't yet. So sorry about that. So I uh, got my Flexmark call in the mail yesterday. Easiest cow call ever. Yes, Jason, the Flexmark is also another great little um, kind of bite and blow type call. Um, for those of you that, that don't know what we're talking about, if you, again, go to the YouTube channel, go into videos, call reviews, uh, there's a review I did in there of a small little Flexmark cow out call. It has some just amazing, amazing sounds to it. For those that, cow, that for those of you that really struggle with diaphragm reads, the Flexmark is a great choice. So, okay. Um, Something else I kind of want to touch on. Um, federal government report says ozonics damages lungs. I can get you the two links to reports. Yeah, absolutely, Gary. If you've got any reports or anything on the ozonics, yeah, definitely uh, send it over. I'll do a little bit of research, you know, on that as well. So, um, 
Okay, I've seen a lot of these posts on Facebook yesterday or, or lately, and I have received a couple of messages from um, students where they have gone out scouting, and basically they're 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 calling in elk before season. Um, I, I I've actually had a few discussion with people. I, I strongly encourage not to do it. I know we're excited. I know we want to get out there. We want to get to calling in bulls. Um, but I have heard too many horror stories of people calling in bulls multiple times before season while they're out scouting. And then as soon as season starts, something happened and that bull's not there. Now, granted, I know some of the discussions I've had with people, um, they didn't wind us, they didn't blow out. Okay question I have for you is if you were out there and you were calling in bulls, that bull came in looking for that elk, didn't see it, he left. Okay. Didn't wind you, didn't blow out, but can you guarantee that after you left that area, that those bulls didn't come back in looking for the elk that was making the sound and all of a sudden catch a, your scent wafting around in that area? Remember guys, when we're walking through the forest, we do drop scent. We have dead skin cells that fall off, off of our skin that float in the wind. We're leaving scent. So, um, no one says it, but thanks for all your information and reviews. Appreciate that, Jeremy. Actually, quite a few people, um, you know, do, do definitely, uh, do definitely say it, but you know, it's, it's always nice to hear. So now, Calling before season, um, I will admit, I have called before season, but I do the night bugling, meaning I get to a spot and I will throw out one or two location bugles just to get a response. And usually I only do that a few days before season. Okay, so Saturday I'm going up to pull trail cameras. So Friday night, I'm going to get up to one knob and I'm going to throw a location bugle or two up into that basin that has multiple draws just to hear. That's it. I don't go in there. I don't try to call in bulls. I don't do any of that. You are asking for those elk to leave the area. Okay. There's enough talk out there about call shy elk and educated elk and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I've, I've touched on it before. You know, do I think elk are educated or, or call shy? You know, yeah, they can be a little bit leery. But most of the time, it's because people are out there that are making sounds that they, they don't understand what's going on. They don't understand the sounds that they're making. They don't understand, you know, what they're saying. They think a cow call is a cow call and a bugle is a bugle. And, 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 and so because of that and because of that approach, yeah, elk have become leery. And that's why in the academy and in the lessons, we talk about understanding what you're hearing, knowing what you're hearing, knowing what you're saying back and, and adding realism into your calling and into your setups. That is what's going to separate you from everybody else that's out there. Um, you know, we've all heard this before. Leave your bugle at home. You bugle and, in, 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 you know, you bugle out there and elk just run the other way. I love that statement because then all of a sudden I just get this picture in my head that every time a bull cracks off or that there's a bugle, there's just elk running every direction from it. Well, if that's the case, if they really run from a bugle, they're a herd animal. How do they ever, ever gather up? How do they breed? How do they ever repopulate? It's not that they're running from a bugle. It's because of what you are doing is not realistic. Or the other thing that I hear a lot is, oh yeah, we bugle and the elk just run the other way. But what's really happening is that bull is heading to his bedding area and he's bugling at that person saying, come on, you know, we're going this way. Come follow us. But as, as they continue to go to that bull, that bull is continuing to move. Well, yeah, that could have the appearance of, oh, the bull's running. No, he's not. He's just heading to a destination. So 
Gentry Batiz, how you doing, bud? Uh, Alex, would you use those elk in the heat spray bombs that are in a can during the early season? Um, I've only played with the scent bombs one time, Alex. Um, I really can't say if it was effective or, or not effective. Um, I mean, it, if it's legal in your state and yeah, it does have elk and heat. Absolutely. I mean, you know, like I said, I use, I use these a bunch, so I, I definitely do add scents into the mix. Um, you know, especially nice thing is with those, you know, on the trees right there next to you, it can, you know, cover you a little bit. So, uh, Jeremy, can you give your opinion on ethical hunting shots? I have seen on YouTube, heard of people telling their story of 80 plus yard shots where are you at on it? Great question, Jeremy. I got into archery to see how close I could get to animals. That's what I love. That's exciting to me. Um, you know, and, and I know there's been a lot of debate out there and a lot of argument about these 80, 90 yard shots and the skill that it takes to execute that shot. And, and, and yeah, I'll admit it. It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of training to execute an 80 yard shot, but you are taking a shot on a wild animal that can take a step that can jump. I mean, a bull elk with one step, all of a sudden your, your shot goes from hitting in the vital to hitting in the rump. There's too much that can happen. Plus the kinetic energy and the speed that your arrow is losing at those longer yardages just not getting as much penetration. Um, and, and I've heard all the arguments. Well, that's why I shoot 80 pounds. Okay, great. Get in an awkward position to where you're ducking down underneath a branch or something. And here comes a bull trotting in and you're stuck and you have to draw your bow in an awkward position. Or you're sitting flat on your butt eating your lunch and a bull pipes off and you answer him and he comes running in. You have to draw your bow sitting on your butt. Okay. So, so like I said, for me, I want to get them as close as possible because in my eyes, in my mind, I think there's a greater skill set needed to get a bull that close, to fool a bull and coax him into coming that close. We have had some shots that are four yards less than four yards. I mean, to the point where the shooter is actually wondering if the arrow is going to fully leave his bow by the time it, you know, connects with that animal. Of all the bulls that I have shot in my 30 years of hunting, my average shot is 22 yards. So what's the closest you have had? Dimitri, I've actually had elk come up and try to nibble on the leaves on my jacket before. So it's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. So it's 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 pretty cool, but yeah. So you know, everybody needs to establish their effective range, and their effective range is the max range that you can consistently put every arrow in a circle about that big, every arrow. So for me, I mean, forty forty five yards. 45, I might push it to 50. I'm pretty comfortable with that. But again, I want to see if I can get him closer. So maybe I need to let that bull walk off, reposition, reset up, re-engage, and you know, call him back in for that, that close shot. If you've ever tracked a bull that has been hit with a bad shot to where you are going mile, two miles, up a ridge, down the backside, across the nasty creek, up the other side, you will all of a sudden start to think differently on your shot execution on animals. So, so that's just kind of, kind of my take on it. So the art of hunting is getting the animal in close. If you have to take long shots, you're not a hunter, just a shooter, hone your skills, be a hunter. True. Now, 
let me kind of back up on that and say, if I had already had one arrow in a bull, and maybe it was a marginal shot or this or that, and I'm slipping in and 70 yards is as close as I could get. The fact that I already have one arrow in him, then yeah, I would go ahead and take that shot to get a second arrow in him and get him down on the ground faster. What is the name of the elk attractant stick you showed? It is Hot Sense, which HOT, H-O-T-T, -T, stands for Hot on the Trail. So, okay, I know season is coming ra really quick. I mean, some of you guys are opening this weekend. Some are already open. Utah or uh, Idaho is opening next week. Um, you know, we're already smelling the coolness in the air in the mornings. Um, it's it's here. So hopefully you guys have your gear lined out. You're ready. One other thing that I did this weekend was um, I have seven reads that I keep going back and forth on. I really don't know which one's kind of my favorite. So um, I pulled the camera out this weekend and I stepped away from the camera and I called on all seven of those reads. I did cow sounds. I did bugles. I wanted to know what those sounded like from a distance, because when we're calling and projecting out, we think it sounds one way, but as soon as you record it and listen to it, it sounds completely different. Jack, what scent stick do you use the most? I use the uh, elk, cow elk estrus the most, because <clears throat> really, I mean, you guys have heard me talk about, you, you know I love the breeding sequence. Um, it's, it's a very, very effective tool. Uh, and so that's why I kind of want that cow elk estrus. In fact, let me, let me expand on that. This is why I love the breeding sequence so much. So cow elk will do the same vocalizations all throughout the year. They don't have a certain vocalization for the rut for September time. All their vocalization sounds they do all year long. Bulls will locate bugle all year long. But the thing about the breeding sequence is within the breeding sequence, you introduce bull vocalizations like huffs, grunts, and whines, uh, glunks, raking, lip ball bugle. These are all elk vocalizations that only happen during the rut. And bulls know that these sounds only happen during the rut. Mr. Jonathan Alexander, how you doing, bud? So when they hear these sounds, they know what is going on. They recognize those sounds as a bull with a hot cow. So that's why it's so effective. But the thing is, is it is definitely something that you have to build up when you do the breeding sequence. So the best way I can describe it is imagine you are building a fire, okay? You don't go from no fire to four foot flames just like that. Jason, how you doing, bud? Scott, welcome. So when you're building a fire, you start small and you get that flame going. And then you add some more fuel to that fire to make it a little bit larger. Then you add a little bit more fuel to make it even a little more larger then a little more fuel to make it larger. That's what basically, you know, you guys do with that breeding sequence is you start small and then you build that up. And along with building that up, bulls that hear it and recognize it, well, their excitement level is building up as you're building the excitement level up. So it goes hand in hand. And like I said, they recognize that sound. Those bulls will want to come in and check that cow out because they, they want a shot at breeding her. So uh, do you feel altitude and humidity impacts arrow flight? If so, what tips would you have to prepare? Just adjust once on location. Um, <clears throat> you know, Dimitri, I, I, I really don't. Um, you know, usually as soon as I get to camp, you know, I, 
I try to shoot at least every other day in camp, every couple of days, even if it's on the hillside and you're shooting into a, a, a rotten stump, just something to make sure that your equipment hasn't gotten bumped, that everything's still on. So, um, but no, I don't, I don't think altitude or humidity really, really impacts any of it. So Benito, welcome. Gentry, how do you get ready mentally and physically? So, uh, physically, as you guys know, I just partnered with I Hunt Fit. Um, you know, Matt and the crew over there. So I've I've been doing the I Hunt Fit, you know, program. The the thing I like about the I Hunt Fit is it's fresh, it's new each 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 day. You never do the same workout over and over again. But it it is a program that is specifically targeted, you know, for hunters, and it's not targeted to build big bulk and mass and, and this and that it's, it's designed to build strength and endurance. So that way you have the muscle strength when you need it, but then you really have the muscle endurance, which, you know, it can be grinding out in elk country. They live in tough, tough country and, and it's steep, rugged country. And you need that, you need that endurance, especially once you get one down on the ground. And I know it always happens. You get the bull on the ground and while you're packing that bull out, you are kind of cussing yourself out, cussing out your hunting partner for shooting the elk in that area. And it's the worst pack and you're going to die and oh my God, what did we get ourselves into? But isn't it amazing how as soon as you get that animal off the mountain and you're back at camp, all of a sudden it's like, you know, God, that really wasn't that bad. And yeah, but think about it. What do you guys remember more? That difficult pack that you had or that nice easy one that you actually drove the truck up to and threw it in the back hole? I've never had that problem. I've never had that happen. So I don't know. Uh, hey, Alex, packed and ready to go. Anthony Kafaru saves my body. There's a lot of great packs out there. So key thing is, though, is whatever pack you get, make sure it is adjusted to fit your body and it is set up for your body. And then you will be able to get the most out of that pack. A lot of the packs, um, you know, Black's Creek, XO, Kafaru, Everly Stock, uh, Initial Ascent. Most of these packs will be able to pack more weight than your body can actually handle. So now, Gentry, as far as the mentally side, um, you know, growing up, I was an athlete. So, you know, I just have that, that, that ability to mentally focus and mentally get in the game. It can be tough, though, sometimes out there, especially when you are really covering a lot of country. You're not hearing any elk. Um, you know, it can really drag you down. Um, so mentally, what I start doing is really paying attention to the surroundings. You know, you can really see some cool things, you know, the way the light kind of comes through the trees or, or this or that. So it's probably only at exaggerated range and perhaps not relevant. I had agreed to get them close. Okay, same. Cow call using a bugle tube. Is it used for bull, cow, or both? Uh, TT, you can actually, uh, you, you know, a grunt tube is just a megaphone is, is what a grunt tube is. And it's basically there to amplify whatever sound you're doing. If you're bugling through it, it's going to amplify and allow you to reach out farther. Same thing with cow calling through a grunt tube. Um, basically, it just gives a little bit more depth to it, a little more, bit more volume and allows you to kind of reach out. So, yeah, absolutely. I will do both cow sounds and bugles uh, through a grunt tube. Uh, Alex, what do you do to calm down and steady yourself for the shot? I'm always jittery and shaking like crazy. Um, you know, Alex, here's, I, I'm with you. My hunting partners laugh at me because as soon as I see that bull committed and coming in, I start really getting the body shakes really bad. And it's just a rush of adrenaline. But what's crazy is as soon as I draw the bow and anchor, I'm rock solid. But as soon as I see that arrow go through that bull, you can probably feel my body tremors three states away from Idaho. And they laugh at me big time when I get those tremors. But that is just the adrenaline that I love about, um, you know, hunting elk. And 
the day that stops is the day that that I stop chasing elk. The day that jitter and shake goes away. Now to steady yourself, what I do is when when I am shooting my bow and I'm practicing, I have a routine that I go through in my mind. The way I knock the arrow, the way I play with the peep, the way I put you know my release on the D loop the way my hand goes on. And so I mentally run through that checklist every time on every shot while I'm practicing so that when I'm out there and there's a bull coming in, it just becomes automatic. I don't even really, uh, you know, force myself to do it. I automatically start going through that checklist. So, um, but as far as the shaking, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, once you get drawn, the shaking goes away. I'm not sure, you know, where you're at in your elk, elk hunting career. I know early on, um, it's one of those things that can really rock you um, with the adrenaline and 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 the nervousness. It's it's just one of those things that the more times you do it, the more encounters you have, the more easier it becomes. That's that's why, you know, I just shake my head when I hear somebody say, yeah, I'm a brand new elk hunter. I'm going to go out and hold out for a 350 or 360 bull. And that's, that's all I'm going to take. Love the enthusiasm. It's probably not going to happen uh, just because of the adrenaline and the inability to keep your composure. That's why a lot of you guys that are brand new to elk hunting. Um, I've had some students on lately that their approach is awesome. They're like, you know what, if it's a cow, if it's a spike, if it's a legal elk, I am going to zip an arrow through it because I want to experience that. I want to know what it's like. I think that is a great approach for your first couple of years to get comfortable executing that shot, learning how to control your nerves, learning how to control your adrenaline. Because when the time comes that a 350 or a 360 bull comes out, you have a better understanding of what's about to take place and you can control your nerves a little bit better. So uh, let's see, I've had a pretty fun pack, but not during archery. I'm planning on grinding this year. I say positive no matter what. Absolutely. You know, positive is uh, is a great mindset to have, but uh, it, it'll get you down sometimes. So what about barometric pressure? I was told it can change elk activities on level 29 and up. Yes, Mad Viking. So barometric pressure does play on the elk. So it seems like once that barometric pressure gets above 29, there's not much bugling. So the other thing too is, is as that barometric pressure kind of rises, that air gets really, really heavy. Um, you, you know, you guys pay attention to that when you're out there this, this fall, if you get into an area and you bugle and there's absolutely no echo on your bugle, see if you hear any bugles in that area that day. My experience tells me when there, when, when I bugle and I don't hear an echo, I'm not going to hear any bugles in that area. In fact, I will actually leave that area and go someplace else until I hear echo on my location bugles. So, all right, we got some more. Um, Noah, thanks for all the info. I'm going on my first elk hunt and I've been watching a lot of elk videos and notice each time an elk is shot, the shooter or caller lets off a few cow or bull calls. Why is that? So Noah, what you're trying to do there, the reason that, that they're following up the shot with a cow call or two is they're just trying to calm that animal down. I mean, that bull doesn't know or that cow or whatever elk you're zipping an arrow through, they really don't know what happened. They don't know if they got stung by a bee or, or, or what. But by doing a cow sound after the shot can calm them down. But here's the important thing. And I know it's going to be tough because, again, this is controlling your excitement. So a shot happens. Just a couple of nice, soft cow calls. Most people, and I'm sure you guys have seen this on video, they shoot. Well, that's that's an excited cow. That's 
not really trying to calm that bull down. That's 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 an excited tone that really could have the um, opposite effect of what you're doing. So yeah, just a couple of soft cow calls. I'll probably never kill a 350 because I always shoot the first legal bull. Jairus, I know, and I, I hate to tell you this, but you can't shoot the big ones if you don't let the little ones go. But then again, the little ones, especially on public land, that might be the only opportunity you have. Thanks for all the info. I appreciate it. Rico, you bet. Thanks for all of your input and info. Time to go shoot some arrows before dark. You rock, bud. Alex, appreciate that. Good luck. Uh, I told a couple of groups about your lesson in Wednesday Live Facebook. They were asking for info about elk hunting. That's cool, Bernie. I appreciate that. Uh, Charles, lighted knocks. I might have missed your answer. No, I just haven't uh, had a chance to jump there. So um, lighted knocks, they're actually illegal in Idaho right now. We can't shoot them. Uh, my opinion on them, I think they are a great tool. So if they ever do become legal in Idaho, you bet I will shoot lighted knocks. The reason I think they're a great tool is because with the speed of a lot of the bows that are on the market today, it's getting harder and harder to see the arrow. When I first started archery hunting, we really didn't have that problem. Um, and in fact, some of the things that we used to do to gain speed was a little sketchy. How many of you guys that are a little older remember overdraws? and rolling your cables to really pump up the poundage on your bows. So for those of you that don't know what an overdraw is, it's something we used to use back in the 90s. So I have a 29 and a half, 30 inch draw. An overdraw would bring the rest so far back that it would allow you to shoot about a 25 inch arrow, really, really short, but you picked up a lot of speed. So, um, so, Anyways, sorry, I'm chasing down rabbit holes. Lighted knocks. Yes, I do think they are a great tool because they really allow you to track the arrow and really understand the hit a lot better. But then you also have a much better chance of recovering your arrow because you can get so much information off that arrow. Color of blood. Are there bubbles in it? You know, what is a was it a paunch shot? So you know immediately how that shot was so yes a fan of lighted knocks so all right um if you don't get that shake i don't think we would do it absolutely the shake is 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 key jeremy have you done a release video uh do you have a preference i haven't done a release video just because i know releases are one of those things that are so personal um my personal preference, I like to shoot a three finger thumb release, a T release. Um, for me, I just feel stronger in the draw cycle. I feel stronger when I'm anchored in with that. Um, a few of the ones that I really like on that are the Spot Hog Whippersnapper, um, the Knock To It, which is basically a Carter release. Um, I know True Fire has a new one out that I've been looking at. I haven't had a chance to play with it yet. Um, but those, those are just kind of a couple that, that, you know, I really like, um, <clears throat> I have shot the trigger style releases in the past. I used to shoot the little bitty goose, um, for quite a while and, you know, the spot hog is, is, as well. So, uh, but that's just my personal preference. If you're really looking for releases, try a few different styles, uh, a few different triggers, whether it's a straight trigger or a swoop trigger, uh, you know, try some of the thumb releases and just see what, you know, you kind of, you know, feel most comfortable with. So I just got some Phelps diaphragms. Hope they work well. Saga Phelps makes some really, really good diaphragms. Carter White Weiss choice is what Charles shoots. All right. Uh, we had a couple of others. Um, What's your opinion on using a resistance type of release while hunting? So Anthony, I assume you're talking about a hinge release, um, back tension release. You know what, if that's what you have confidence in, then by all means hunt with it. I have shot with a hinge release before, mainly for target. So um, I do know a couple of guys that hunt with them just because that's the release they have confidence in. 
the only thing is, and, and the reason I've never hunted with one is because there's sometimes you do need to kind of rush a shot a little bit. Um, you know, you only got a split second for that bull to stop and bang, you're firing where sometimes with that hinge release, uh, you're not able to kind of manipulate it. But then also on the flip side too, if you really have to rush the shot that much, is it really a shot you want to take? So personal preference, uh, Robert, Colorado, it's ill. It's, it's legal. Um, oh, on the lighted knocks. Okay. Chad White, how you doing, bud? Jonathan, raking really works. So does the whole display bugle. Just got to stick with it and be patient. Yes. Brandon Scott, James Walcott. Tex, how you doing, bud? So, all right, guys. Um, coming up. So, this Friday's video, like I said, is going to be on the Game Changer. Next Friday's video is going to be the results of the 2018 Grunt Tube Challenge. All I am going to say is there are seven tubes in the video. And I really think that you guys are going to be surprised by the bugle that is in the top spot right now. So how's that for a little teaser? So... Bernie, good luck to you. To also, James, what's up? Um, you know, hey, just sitting here talking a little bit of elk hunting for a little while. Sean just joined us. How you doing, bud? Uh, glad I finally got to catch a live show. Thanks for all the great info as always. Jason, my pleasure. Uh, Gentry, aren't you hunting next Friday? Yes, I am actually um, heading up to camp Thursday right after work. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, um, yeah, I'll start hunting and I'll hunt Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, maybe Tuesday, come back for a couple of days, head back up. Then I have to come back for another three days of lessons. And then I am done for the month and you guys won't, uh, see me very much for the rest of September. I will still try to get videos done so that way you know there's some informational for wednesdays there's some informational for fridays and try to get that stuff so jimmy three weird that you would vote for uh that one jimmy uh terry johnston thanks mike for the great info great as always terry it's my pleasure um do you treat morning and evening hunts the same no i do not um reason I say that is because morning hunts, you typically have more time to get on the elk and work the elk, where a lot of times the evening, especially early on, they don't move until late. So it's really fast and furious. So where you are at, and, and, and that's another reason I stay out there all day. Um, you know, you started working them, following them in the morning. You followed them to their bedding areas. I know I've talked about this, guys. I do not go into bedding areas. I hunt the fringes. But that afternoon, evening time, I'm close enough to those bedding areas that as soon as those elk get up and moving, I'm within striking distance that I can get on them very, very quick and try to have as much time as possible to really, really work those bulls. Yeah, ready to hunt some grizz country again. Yeah, and James, you guys got a couple of grizzlies over there. Uh, farewell in the elk woods, everyone. Robert Gonzalez, uh, good luck to you, bud. Okay, here's one other thing that I want to um, kind of touch on. So this this kind of came up the other day in, in a lesson, and we were kind of talking about this because – the, the gentleman I was talking to, he lives in California. He hunts in Eastern Oregon. So obviously him trying to get time up to do scouting is a little bit tougher. But if you guys kind of use those first couple of days as kind of scouting days while you're hunting, you can learn a lot about the area. And, and here's what I mean. So if you're in a new area, so let's say the season is opening. Okay, so the season's opening on Saturday for some of you guys. So you go up to camp on Friday. You get camp set up, and then you go up to an elevated position that maybe you can glass from. Pay attention to where elk are coming out of the timber. Okay, you see them come out of the timber. That's probably their bedding area. Mark that on a map. 
and then just kind of stay there after it gets dark for a little bit and listen. See if they start cracking off bugles. If they start bugling, pay attention to where they're moving to. Then once they bugle from a set spot, guess what? You just found their feeding area. Mark it on a map. Now you have their bedding area, you have their feeding area, and you have their travel route of where they went from bed to feed. Then the next morning, you know there's elk there. You start heading in there. Now all of a sudden you figure out their travel corridor from feeding to bedding. Here it is noon on the first day, and I already have their bedding area, their feeding area, their travel corridor from feed to bed, and their travel corridor from bed to feed, all figured out that quick. And you have it marked on a map. So if you have Onyx or base map, whatever you like to run on your phone, you know, mark those on there. You do this with different areas that you hunt within your area, because remember, Try to get multiple areas so that way you don't go into the same area day after day after day. Then after the season, you come home, you pull up your map on the computer. Now you're looking at the bigger map. All of a sudden, you get this huge picture of where all the feeding areas are, where all the bedding areas are, where all their travel corridors are. Your job just got a whole lot easier on locating elk and finding elk. Now, granted, I know it's public land and there's different factors with other hunters and this and that that can alter that. But if you're in a place that is not heavily hunted or maybe an area that a lot of people overlook, those elk are going to stay in that pattern for quite a while until you bump them, until you push them out. That's why selecting multiple different places that you hunt day after day and also controlling the amount of human scent that you're dropping in there, you're going to keep those elk in that normal pattern longer and you're going to have a much better time of locating elk, finding elk and encountering elk day after day after day. Then that cool thing is, like I said, you do that night bugling where you get up onto that elevated you crack off that location bugle, or maybe you sit quiet until one cracks off. Oh, okay, he's in a draw. We're hunting a draw tomorrow. You know, they're up, they're there. The other neat thing, too, is based on their responses and based on what they're doing. If you're just hearing a bugle fest go on, you immediately know there's a hot cow in drainage C. There's a lot of bulls bugling. That's where we're going tomorrow morning. The other neat thing is you can do the reverse, especially early in the year where bulls are just establishing their pecking order. You get up early before light and you go to that knob and you listen. Now, maybe all of a sudden, you know, they're bugling a little bit more at night, but all of a sudden you notice one bull is just... I mean, his bugles are short, they're higher volume, he's just got a lot of growl at the end. Man, that dude is just pissed off. His aggression levels, are, you know, is raised. Take advantage of that. That's where you're going. Okay, we're, we're going to draw B. That bull is aggravated. His aggression levels are raised. We're going to go in there and we're going to take advantage of his raised aggression levels. And that's the bull that we're hunting today. Then you get in your truck, you move to where you need to, to gain access to that draw. Then you go up and you take advantage of that bull. That is how you can be successful on finding elk every day and finding elk that are bugling. So uh, you have to shoot a 320 or bigger. You know what, Gentry, stuff like that don't matter to me. To me, it's the experience. I go out, my intent is a five point or bigger. I have never put a bull in the record book. A lot of my hunting partners that I have called for, they have bulls in the book. Record book doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is the experience, the time spent with my friends and something really cool that happened on that hunt that I can look at that rack all winter long and smile about the time that we had. If he happens to be a 320, great. But, you know, these people that put this pressure on themselves that they have to go out and they have to shoot a 330 or they have to shoot a 340 or, oh, my God, it has to be this or nothing else. They're not enjoying the hunt. They don't understand what, what it's really about out there. 
All they care about is fame, notoriety, and getting their name in a book or something on the wall that they can pull, have people come over to the house and say, look at this. I'm not that kind of guy. So one shot, one kill. Think we'd get some bugle back this early? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and that's why I was kind of talking about if, if, if you're sitting there, you know, this time of year with the season just starting, understanding that these bulls are establishing their pecking order and rounding up their cows, um, you know, you hear that one bull that's agitated, you bet he's going to respond to you, especially if you move in close and start pestering them. So, all right, guys, look at that. We are an hour and five minutes in. I think we are going to wrap up. So again, I appreciate all of you guys tuning in tonight. Um, oh, update on the Carbon TV. Everything did get on set with all of the um, the new video for chapter one of the Beginner's Guide to Elk Calling. I'm actually recording a couple of more chapters for it this weekend. We are getting closer and closer to Carbon um, going live. So, uh, let's see. First legal bull is getting an arrow in him. Can't eat antlers. Absolutely. And I really, really enjoy elk steaks. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to eat a tag before, but it's not very good at all. I don't care how you fix it. I don't care what the recipe is. James, the first few days we seek out the big bulls that are in the irritation stage. They don't want any other bull around. Yep. They're establishing that pecking order. It's a great time to call in the big herd bulls. They were bugling last week when I was in Idaho and it worked everything you taught me. Just want to let you know. Outstanding. So Terry is a student of Elk Calling Academy that she and I have done about eight lessons together. Um, she also does a little bit of guiding. So that's really, really cool that uh, um, some of the things were applied and you found success. So, all right. Those of you that are in Oregon, good luck to you this weekend. Be safe. May your arrow fly straight and true and find its mark. I wish everybody the best of luck. Um, we will be back on next week um, uh, for next week's session of, of live Q&A, and we will do a live Q&A um, the week after that. As always, thanks for what you do, bro. I'm like a sponge learning new things all the time. Jack, good luck, good luck to you, buddy. So... All right, guys, as always, keep calling, keep practicing. Most importantly, have fun. I appreciate each and every one of you. Love these times together. So Friday night, tune in, check out the Game Changer video. For those of you that do want to go ahead and go get one, go to G4 Archery, get one for yourself. And we will see you guys next week on the next chapter or episode of Wapiti Wednesday Live Q&A. Have a great night, everybody.